<clears throat> thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Mary. Um, you know, um, what you have, uh, what you uh, and the communications work group in association with Lotus Nile uh, uh, colleagues have created here is nothing short of extraordinary. So these uh, toolkits that you have made, key messages that you've created are really, truly really speaking, exceptional. Uh, I, I realize that some of the slides, especially the ones that had the a couple of screenshots of the website were a bit blurred because this was a video that we were uploading and not a live presentation. So I just wanted to go through some of those uh, slides again uh, so that you can actually, you know, in the audience, you, it's it's much, much, much better clear what exactly is it that we were talking about. This particular slide is the uh, the list of all of the papers uh, and again, the same papers that I also talked about in my uh, brief remarks earlier. Uh, so these are all of the papers that have been all published in Journal of Perimetrology. There are a couple of papers that are still coming up, hopefully within the next uh, few months uh, and, and next year, they're going to be published soon. And this uh, slide uh, was the, the screenshot of the INC uh, website that is present on um, cpath.org uh, backslash programs backslash inc uh, and backslash resources so this is where all of the resources in terms of the communication toolkits uh, and the uh, information about the current scientific meeting you know that is where all of these uh, toolkits including all of the communication resources are going to be found again i would like to reiterate that the toolkit that mary talked about in her presentation is currently live you can actually go to this link and uh, uh, just access the toolkit as is right now for your own use if you if you choose to do so and I encourage you to actually use it. Uh, this particular uh, slide was the one that had uh, screenshots of an actual example of the toolkit. For example, on the on the left hand side is the uh, are the, the social media uh, uh, key messages along with some of the graphics that you can directly download and use it in your social media posts along with the and you can copy and paste some of those uh, key messages that Mary talked about on the right hand side is basically uh, uh, an example of a one sheeter uh, that the one this one has been specifically prepared for a neonatal adverse event severity scale there is another one that is talking generally about INC uh, and obviously the communications uh, work group will continue working on more such uh, worksheets as time goes on in the future. This website, uh, this slide is basically a screenshot of also of the INC uh, website, uh, which talks about some of the FAQs that uh, Mary talked about in her, her talk earlier. So, you know, they talk about the questions such as why is uh, a neonatal adverse event severity scale necessary. Uh, how did INC's recommendations for design of therapeutic trials for neonatal seizures come about and so on and so forth. Just it'll give you a much broader and much thorough uh, information about why behind what uh, that we have been doing over the past several years now. And this one uh, is a screenshot of some of the uh, opportunities uh, uh, that are coming up in the next uh, several months. For example, uh, some of the meetings, INC annual meeting, for example, then there's a e EFPIA meeting, then there are some anniversaries of some of the more notable events that happened in the neonatal drug of development space, uh, and then, you know, uh, and so on and so forth. So this is basically just to give you an idea of what other opportunities that are upcoming in the upcoming weeks, months, uh, so that you can potentially go to the INC website, download the key messages, download the images, and if you choose to do so, uh, you know, um, basically, uh, use them in if you are participating in any of those meetings, use those key messages to promote the work that INC has been doing. And uh, again, uh, thank you again uh, to the uh, everybody in the communications work group from my side as well uh, for such a great job on creating these key messages in the toolkits. I encourage you again to answer the poll that appears on the right hand side of uh, your screen. Uh, and uh, basically just getting an idea about the likelihood and your enthusiasm to use some of the the tools that uh, comms work group has developed so far and that concludes the communications work group uh, update uh, the next up is 
uh, by uh, Dr. Thomas Elliots, who is the pediatric cardiology fellow at U UC Leuven, and he's going to be talking about safety and ad adverse event workgroup update, where he'll discuss developing and validating a neonatal adverse event severity scale. Hey everybody, uh, good evening at this side of the world, good uh, afternoon at the other side. Um, so, yeah, it's always funny to uh, look at my title here as Pediatric Cardiology Fellow. Uh, this, is, this is my current um, uh, job, uh, my current uh, challenge uh, professionally. Um, but before, I was actually doing a PhD um, at the Neonatology Ward in our hospital. And, and so, as a part of that PhD, actually, all the work of, uh, I, I was also collaborating to the work on the uh, Neonatal Adverse Event Severity Scale. Um, so let's see if I can move the slides. Yeah. So some of you might already um, know part of this presentation as before summer at the PAS. Um, I already presented part of it, but I think this this kind of meeting is always a nice occasion um, to show to uh, the rest of the group and maybe also to new people that uh, recently uh, joined in uh, what we have been working on and, and where we're uh, standing. So, um, so yeah, briefly to give a bit of background. Um, so we have been working on, on, on data standards and, and so this nice uh, small cartoon actually shows why data standards can be very important. Um, so this is the a picture of a, a Mars climate orbiter that crashed on the surface of, of Mars in 1999. And basically the reason why it crashed was because of the fact that the, the, the tool, the, the, the climate orbiter itself was programmed uh, by uh, people from the UK in, in uh, in yards, uh, while people that were controlling the uh, the orbiter were actually using the metric system, and so because of the fact that uh, both teams didn't use the same data standards, uh, the, the the climate orbiter uh, crashed. Um, and that's just to illustrate why why data data standards are uh, so important. Um, when we're talking about um, about drug safety, uh, we're talking about adverse event reporting, actually. Um, and there are several aspects of adverse event uh, reporting that uh, that are important. There's uh, grading of the uh, seriousness, which is a regulatory uh, obligation. There's uh, there's determining uh, causality, uh, whether it's related, doubtful, possible, probable, or definitely uh, related uh, to uh, drug administration. Uh, and finally, uh, when an adverse event is graded, uh, re um, um, investigators can also assign a severity grade, which is more uh, a clinical uh, grade, actually, and more layered than the regulatory the, the regulatory definition of, of serious. So usually it's done in five uh, grades: mild, moderate, severe, life-threatening, and and that. And so in this work, we actually focused on uh, standardizing how people. Uh, report adverse event severity. And so uh, for uh, a lot of people uh, in the room here, this is probably old. Huh? So this is what we've done so far. Uh, we developed actually um, standardized adverse event severity uh, criteria. We went through a whole Delphi process. I won't go too much into detail in into detail here, resulting in um, the uh, in the following scale, defining actually what severity is in the you know, severity of adverse events. And so um, Comparably, or in, in, in line with other uh, adverse event severity scales in other population, we also define five grades, mild, moderate, severe, life threatening, and that. And we actually came up with uh, specific <coughs> criteria or definitions that. Um, that uh, might help investigators to assign severity grades uh, to neonates. And so the problem with the existing scales was, of course, that a lot of the criteria that were included were not were, were completely not applicable uh, to neonates. And in this case, it's specifically for uh, for neonates. Um, I won't. Um, so uh, we we also went a step further and. and um, so we applied these generic severity criteria and these generic definitions onto 35 uh, um, typical um, and common adverse events in, in neonates. And so you can see the list of the adverse events for which we currently have uh, specific criteria available um, here. And so all um, so all terminology, both the definitions of these adverse events and then the uh, severity grades are actually linked to existing terminology databases. Uh, for instance, um, it's linked to METRA, uh, which is quite important for uh, drug development. Uh, and it, it's also linked to um, 
uh, NCI um, vocabulary services. So there's a, a whole bunch of dictionaries there already with uh, uh, with coded uh, terminology, and so actually all terms in our adverse event security um, scale are linked to, to these kind of scripts. And you can find the link here on this slide as well on where you can find uh, our um, severity scale. So it's currently available as well through uh, the vocabulary services of, of NCI. Um, and it's also maintained by, uh, by, by their team, uh, actually. And so on this link, uh, you can find uh, the, latest, the latest version of, um, and still the first version, actually, of um, the, the INC um, Neonatal Adverse Event Severity Scale. Um, so what have we been working on since then? Uh, so the, the question actually came up whether we should validate or not an adverse event severity scale. And if you look at this kind of documents in other populations, for instance, the biggest example of an adverse event severity scale is the one that is used by um, adult oncology uh, trials, CTCAE. Uh, and so there's more than 500 or adverse events in, in this uh, document. And, and so actually all these documents are just consensus documents. So the, not much of them are actually uh, validated, and, but still we think that the aim of these kind of documents is actually to reduce inter-rater uh, variability. And then, of course, if you define it like that, you come up with a testable uh, hypothesis. Um, and then so uh, for CTCE, for instance, for um, seven of the, the adverse events in um, in their 500 um, adverse event long uh, document, uh, there has been some validation. There has been some researchers looking at inter-rater variability. Um, and so we thought it might be nice as well to have this kind of exercise for um, the neonatal adverse event severity um, scale. And so um, Dr. Singh already mentioned um, that the retrospective uh, validation, sorry for the typo there, um, was a um, was already published recently in the, in the journal of Pedi uh, in in the journal of perinatology, uh, so it has actually been very nice work by uh, mainly Tamara Lewis and, and Kelly Wade. They've really done very well, um, showing actually using actually um, sixty real life adverse event case reports from a recent neonatal clinical trial, uh, of which thirty five of them were serious and. 25 of them were non-serious, and so they were assessed by 12 experienced uh, observers, people from academia, industry, regulatory authorities, and so each of them assessed uh, a part of the uh, adverse events. And so by doing so, they um, could actually show that the ICC, um, the intra-class correlation coefficient, uh, was 0 0.63, with 18% um, having complete agreement and, and no reviewer factor uh, available. And so actually the ICC was a little bit better for the serious uh, adverse events than for the non-serious uh, adverse events. What they also noticed was that reviewers were sometimes a bit unsure about whether they used the appropriate uh, criteria. So they definitely also defined a need for, for training with uh, the module. Um, and um, what they also noticed was that, that, of course, it was a retrospective uh, study, so the case reports that we have didn't always include the necessary information that you would need to uh, classify the adverse events using the, uh, the criteria that we uh, provided. Um, but overall, it's good or moderate uh, reliability, uh, but with still those two uh, points of attention uh, for further uh, development. And so the next step that we're working on now is the prospective validation. So this study has been ongoing over the last year. Um, so there's four um, studies, uh, uh, four parallel studies actually in four centers, one uh, in the EU being Leuven uh, in my center, uh, one in the US being uh, Children's Mercy in, in Kansas City uh, by Tamara Lewis, one in uh, Calgary in Canada uh, by Thierry Lacaz, and then one in uh, Japan um, as well. And, and so um, the, the difference then was now that we're prospectively uh, assessing adverse event severity. So, uh, at uh, 72 hours after occurrence of an adverse event, two uh, independent observers within the unit uh, should, based on their exposure to um, all the data that they have on the, on the patient, uh, grade the clinical severity of the adverse event. Um, and so we're almost finished there. Actually, three centers have finished uh, the complete uh, study. Uh, and so the last center is actually um, finishing within this month. They told me so we're expecting some definitive results uh, soon but for the moment uh, th this is a part of an interim analysis based on the results from uh, Leuven and so what you can see here in the left column is the um, are the ICC's for first 
all um, criteria and then uh, below for only the specific criteria. So excluding adverse events for which we don't have specific criteria yet in the first version of our uh, tool. And so you can see that there is moderate to good if you only look at the specific um, criteria reliability in our prospective study, comparably actually to the retrospective study. But of course there um, we didn't split up specific and, and uh, generic, which was for other reason one of the, 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 the issues that the, the observers mentioned. Uh, we also included actually a training model in this prospective validation to accommodate the, the remark that we've got from the retrospective uh, validation. Um, so yeah, we're actually, actually very uh, interested to see the, the full results. And if you look at these results, you can also see that, that they're actually uh, nicely comparable to other severity scales to the right there that have uh, had this kind of uh, exercise uh, as well. Um, so the scale seem, seems to be performing uh, adequately. Um, so in the perspective validation, I already mentioned that there's also a training phase with actually a pre-phase and a post-phase. And so one of the, the, the very nice questions actually is also to see whether having such a skill also uh, improves um, the inter-observer variability and severity assessments comparing to what we've done previously over the last few years, uh, grading adverse severity, uh, adverse event severity without any guidance. So it, it would actually be nice to see if, if, our, if our work matters. Uh, we hope so, of course. Um, so future perspectives, so completing the prospective validation study, probably within uh, one month we should have all the data and then within a few months I hope to have a manuscript ready there. Um, then increasing the number of adverse events um, in, the, uh, in the scale. Um, so for instance, we don't have lab values for the moment yet. So um, if there are any people that want to invest time in it, uh, they're very welcome, I think, to um, to uh, take it on and, and, uh, and go ahead. Um, and then dissemination of the INC um, of, of our scale to, to all stakeholders. And I really want to thank the communication work group because I have much enjoyed the previous presentation because it seems that they have already done a, a lot of effort there in uh, trying to communicate uh, all the effort that we put in this scale uh, towards the, the larger uh, stakeholder group. So uh, thank you very much for the attention um, and looking forward to uh, the next interesting presentation. Thank you so much, Thomas. Uh, that was really interesting indeed. And I too am looking forward to the completion of your prospective validation study and hopefully uh, take it to our FDA colleagues and get it validated from them somehow in one somewhere or another. But, you know, uh, great presentation. Thank you so much for the updates. And uh, let's go down to the next one. Uh, that is the data terminology workgroup update, which is going to be presented by the workgroup chair, uh, who's uh, uh, Mike Padula who is the medical director of informatics and professor of pediatrics at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And Mike, if you're online, I would invite you to come and make your presentation. Great, thanks Kamaljeet. Um, um, yeah, I'm, I'm one of the co-chairs of the data and terminology work group along with uh, Roger Sol from the University of Vermont and Vermont Oxford Network. I um, wanted to give you just a brief update of our, our group's activities and I'll go in the other direction. Um, so just give you a uh, highlight, I wanted to give you um, a refresher or um, an orientation to our just general approach within the work group. Um, talk a bit about our work to date and our, our projects and projects, progress, projects in progress, um, as well as our plans um, moving forward. So our general um, approach has been to, um, you know, develop criteria um, used in clinical investigation. So, and we've um, really tried to drill down to define um, more discrete observations or criteria that sort of help um, uh, define um, in different concepts or, or terms that we, that we use. Um, so, um, you know, in doing that, it, we are, are really poising ourselves to um, be more precise about the, the data collected and hopefully that gives us some flexibility moving forward. Um, and part of that strategy um, really has to do with the fact that a lot of our definitions or outcomes of interest are constructed by, from these um, sort of collections of um, criteria or findings. And our goal is to um, allow for more precision for how those um, terms are applied um, and really allow you to differentiate um, conditions 
that are similar. So you might have neck with pneumoperitoneum um, versus a spontaneous or focal intestinal, intestinal perforation and understanding, you know, what are the findings that differentiate them? Um, or, you know, and those are, you know, um, or even some uh, ensuring that, um, you know, a, a less serious condition um, might not get um, included with criteria for um, a more um, serious one, such as, you know, cow's milk allergy versus necrotizing enterocolitis with um, hematochesia. Um, another advantage to um, leveraging these you know, more granular uh, data points that we define um, is it allows you to um, stage or uh, apply severity scores, whether it be classifying different um, degrees of bronchopulmonary dysplasia or being able to assign um, Bell's criteria for necrotizing enterocolitis or even coming up with a more novel um, classification um, to, you know, describe the condition or help, um, you know, understand how uh, level of severity might affect um, long-term outcomes or length of stay that, that um, you know, is really providing that flexibility. Um, also very importantly, when you capture data at the more granular level, um, you're able to then uh, test overlap of, say, um, a more strict or rigorous definition versus um, what might, some might consider like a surveillance uh, definition that they might use in a quality improvement network, um, and as well as allow you to compare both past and present um, or, um, definitions. So you can see how um, if you apply your, you know, your an older definition to your current 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 cohort or vice versa, um, you might be able to understand how similar those populations are. Um, and this also gives us a, a sort of a unique long-term opportunity um, to allow definitions to evolve. So you could, you know, understand instead of having a, a sort of yes, you know, they had BPD, you could really differentiate among that cohort, you know, how much did, you know, having the oxygen challenge or, you know, adding the fraction, um, fraction of inspired oxygen um, you sort of affect um, the, the cohort. Um, so along those lines, I think it's um, a use, uh, you know, potentially useful. Um, so our work to date has involved, um, you know, definitions for um, demographics and maternal and fetal concepts, um, as well as um, a number of conditions relating to necrotizing enterocolitis that we've um, work through. Um, as uh, Thomas mentioned, we also published this with our uh, aid of our friends at the Enterprise Vocabulary Services um, in the NCI thesaurus, um, and they can be find, found, um, you know, uh, there. There are a couple different views if you go to the um, website, but there are a, a lot of them are available with their um, def definitions. Um, and um, our work more recently um, has um, been addressing neonatal seizure concepts. So um, that idea of disambiguating what people mean when they use the, the term seizure. Um, there's, we, thanks to um, Janet Soul and, and Anne Massaro, they gave us guidance um, to some important um, references so we could help sort of flesh out details around, um, you know, a, a seizure-like activity or observation um, as well as you know, when it's confirmed by EEG or might be seen on EEG alone. Um, and then a lot of, um, we've been working through a number of the both clinical findings or observations that occur, as well as a lot of the EEG findings specific to neonatal um, seizures in terms of um, differentiating sort of normal versus abnormal activity. Um, so that is ongoing, but it's been, um, you know, uh, uh, educational for me, and hopefully it will be, become a, a, a better uh, reference as we move forward. Um, so our, you know, next steps involve just um, completing um, and further vetting the seizure concepts, um, and we look forward to um, moving on to additional domains, working with other um, work groups and subject matter experts. Um, so please um, reach out if you're um, interested at all. We would love to um, you know, put you in the queue and, and, and work together to address, um, you know, uh, different domains and, and topics. Um, and our long-term goal 
is to develop a reference guide or a bit of a companion guide to aid clinical investigators um, and really provide, you know, um, list of references to various terms or value sets that are defined, as well as different modeling examples. If you are collecting data around, you know, respiratory support or um, enteral feeding or certain areas, we would love to be able to, um, um, or even maternal information, um, we'd love to be able to provide some examples of, you know, how um, you might set up sort of them where that granular data um, capture if it's a primary outcome or reverse a secondary, um, you know, op outcome. So that is our, um, our work to date, and we look forward to uh, um, working with you. And thanks to all of our um, collaborators um, from the work group itself. And um, we've been meeting in smaller groups more recently, but we look forward to um, getting together with a, with a bigger group as we um, have um, more work done. Thank you so much, Mike. Uh, this is a uh, great work and also very important as well. And actually it also ties back to uh, the, the image that Thomas had uh, uh, shown earlier. Standards are very important. Uh, not only it's important for the NAESS project, but for the work that you guys are doing too, because you know there's a great deal of, I guess, you know, different standards, different definitions that people are using in their own uh, research projects. And that really, you know, ends up causing issues when you're talking about specifically uh, neonatal drug development efforts. So thank you again. And uh, I'm pretty sure next year, this time, there will be many more updates to share and we look forward to continuing working on you on this. Yeah, thanks. I couldn't agree more. Um, mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Uh, so the next one up is uh, by Dr. Heike Rebe, who is uh, the professor of perinatal medicine uh, at Bright and Sussex Medical School, and she's the work group chair of the hemodynamic adaptation work group, and she's going to provide an uh, update about uh, the HA work group as well. Heike. Thank you very much. Good afternoon and good evening for those who are in Europe and I don't know, in Japan might be good morning. So I would like to give you an update of our hemodynamic adaptation working group. So first of all, I would like to thank all the members of the working group who worked very hard on uh, doing all the systematic reviews, which we did over the past uh, few years, and especially my co-chair, uh, Janis Dion, and uh, my team here in uh, uh, Brighton, uh, including um, uh, Stephen Bremner as our professor of statistics. Um, so, the, what were the aims of our working group when we started the INC, especially uh, around uh, hemodynamic adaptation? We identified that it's really difficult to, to have uh, proper inclusion criteria which could form uh, the basis of uh, drug study protocols, either for circulatory failure, but also for high blood pressure in the newborn. And we decided to, uh, to do a stage approach by uh, uh, checking what was available in the liter literature and um, uh, to find out what uh, could be def the definition of appropriate measurements of uh, blood pressure. So if I go to the next slide, that's a bit better. So we identified three major uh, questions. So what are the observed ranges of blood pressure by gestational age, weight and postnatal age? What, are, what other factors, uh, especially maternal factors and, and um, uh, other factors like ethnicity, perinatal factors or infant factors uh, could influence uh, the newborn blood pressure. And the third one was what could be recommended measurement methods, which could be used in the future trials. So in the end, we started uh, in a reverse order and we started with the uh, first review on uh, the methods of measurements, which have been published in 2020. And that forms a, a good basis for future uh, 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 study protocols and pediatric investigation pro uh, protocols. And we have heard already in the uh, earlier session in the morning that biomarkers are very important when you want to assess the efficacy, benefits, and side effects of uh, new drug development in neonatal care. And then the next uh, step was to look at the, to the antenatal and perinatal factors, influential neonatal blood pressure. That was a work which was published in September last year and uh, gives a, a quite a wide range of aspects which should be considered um, in future trials and also uh, maternal medication uh, should be considered and might have side effects on uh, neonatal adaptation after birth. 
So, and finally, uh, we are now um, looking at the third question, which is to determine normal ranges for blood pressure by gestational age through the first three months of postnatal age. That's also was also done by means of a systematic review. Where we have now come to the end of uh, the uh, review, and um, I can present you a couple of uh, first um, analysis. Um, so overall, when we we had very very strict uh, inclusion criteria, because obviously you don't want to use blood pressure measurements of babies who are already receiving uh, treatment for perceived circulatory failure, for example. So uh, and the quality of the data had to be of a certain standard and had to be as extractable. Uh, we had a quite an ambitious uh, data analysis plan uh, where we sp uh, split the groups up according to the different uh, maturation and also according to the age after birth. So we start with the first 24 hours and go through uh, first seven days of life and up to three months. And it turned out that actually we did get some data also for the term babies, which we didn't anticipate. Uh, before, so I'm just showing you sharing you a couple of. Um, Plots. Uh, Steve Bremner also has a very clever way of uh, presenting the data in a sort of uh, interesting fashion. So this is data uh, looking at the mean blood pressures in team uh, in term babies plotted by postnatal age. So you see here the publication. Quite often publications give us data points for different time points. So we always start uh, with a. Uh, uh, with the lowest uh, or the youngest uh, age, basically, and then it goes up. And in the term infants, so you can see that the mean is usually around uh, 45 to 50, 55. Um, um, and we also had we looked at systolic, systolic and diastolic blood pressure as well, but I don't have the time to show you all the different plots, which we will put into the uh, publication, which is currently being uh, worked upon. Here's another plot for preterm babies, again, mean uh, blood pressure. Uh, by postnatal age and also by gestation. So Stephen puts a baby's uh, reported uh, studies uh, reported babies below 28 weeks and 28 to 33 and 33 to 37. And overall, there's a trend that with maturity, the blood pressure uh, uh, will go up. And um, if you compare that with the threshold of the uh, 50 uh, millimeters of mercury in term babies, you can see up to about 33 weeks, uh, the baby's blood pressure will be below that. We then go to the next uh, slide. So we can actually uh, define a range, uh, or especially the lower threshold, depending on the maturity. And that is one of the goals we were having so that in future trials, people can uh, rely on, uh, on, on some thresholds, a defined threshold for their individual uh, pediatric investigation plan. Uh, There's another way of looking at it. If you look at the fifth uh, to the 95th percentile and the median, and their uh, differences are more pronounced. Not uh, a lot of studies are reporting on the median, but where they did, we uh, did a summary as well. And here you can see a much better uh, uh, way. So, uh, and that might be a better way of looking at the data because uh, overall the numbers are uh, small. So they're not in the thousands, they're more in the sort of uh, tens to hundreds. And uh, you can see a clear uh, distinct. So again, less than 28 weeks babies are here in the lower part, and then it goes up through the motions uh, to term babies. Uh, we, are, we have also we are also looking at the birth weight. I didn't present the data here, and uh, we are lucky to have some uh, data on postnatal ages uh, up to three months, which is very important if you look into pediatric investigation plans for neonatal hypertension, for example. Overall, we, we found that there were a limited number of suitable manuscripts, especially actually for preterm babies, which I was a bit surprised about. I thought that there would be better studies, but they are not the ones. Uh, uh, quite a number of manuscripts were did not have data which we could extract uh, for the meta-analysis. Um, there was a lot we had to um, uh, so we had to exclude quite a number of uh, studies where uh, only the data was uh, present as graphical data and not as numerical data. So overall, um, it gives us a good basis for um, uh, defining what future prospective data uh, 
are required from large cohort studies and we do hope that with an ink and with the other activities we have we can pursue this further and uh, also put a definition into the manuscript uh, which we will hopefully finish by the end of this year so thank you very much for your attention Thank you so much, Heike. Uh, great presentation. And, you know, I can very much uh, say that, yes, we INC would be able to help you. In fact, that uh, our real world data project where we are collecting lots of EHR data, uh, a component of blood pressure is included in the data that we are collecting and uh, which is going to take a few years to get uh, to a stage where we can analyze the data. But, you know, certainly we, you guys would be the first in our mind when we have the uh, real world uh, blood pressure patient level uh, data collected, which is going to be another whole another level to the world that you guys are doing. And uh, thank you. So the next one up is uh, a recorded presentation by Dr. Rebecca Sleto, who is the professor of pediatric neuroscience at the University of Oxford. She's going to provide an update on the neonatal pain measurement for your group. And her topic is endpoint measurements for evaluating pain in neonates.
established. And thank you. All right. Yeah. <clears throat> thank you so much. Uh, so uh, this was a great presentation by Rebecca's letter. Uh, and as she said, uh, this is a work group that has just started and uh, my hope is by the end of, uh, I guess, you know, same time next year, we would have much more uh, concrete progress uh, in terms of uh, this work group to share with, with the audience. But, you know, again, thank you so much. And I would uh, certainly like to thank all of our work group leads who came and for their time to present uh, about what they have done in the past one year. Uh, and with that, uh, we are going to go on an extended uh, four hour break. Uh, we would reconvene uh, at 6 p.m. Eastern time uh, and the links for the next session should already be there on your in your calendar and in your emails. And the topic for the next session this evening is uh, uh, diagnostic panels for whole genome sequencing and ethical considerations for uh, genetic diagnosis in the neonatal population as well as for gene and cell therapies. Thank you so much again uh, and uh, thanks for sticking by and I look forward to reconnecting with you in about four hours time.